uh, I'll just introduce myself and our observers really quickly. My name is Roy Gao. I'm an astronomer at the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii. I'm sitting in the dark in my in my living room right now, so I don't have better lighting. Um, and along with us observing is Brian Lameau, who is an astronomer at the Gemini okay. Observatory, which is located in on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, and his offices are in Hilo. He's actually right now next door to Gemini's headquarters at the Subaru Observatory headquarters in Hilo, helping us observe. And also observing is Ekta Shah. She's a, She's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California at Davis and is a, a originally from Gujarat, India. Do I have that correct, Ekta? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and actually tomorrow uh, she will be hosting a session of shadow scientists in Gujarati, her native language. Um, so if you're joining tonight because you heard of that, you should come back tomorrow at 7 p.m. Hawaii time, because this one will be all in English. We understand there was some miscommunication uh, about that. Ekta, did, did you want to uh, repeat that in Guj Guj Gujarati? Sure. Do you want to Do you want to Okay. 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 Here we go. Um, sorry, there was like multiple screens going on. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? <laughs> I, speed I can hear you, Okay, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, um, so basically, uh, let me say in Gujarati. Uh, okay, so you have a WhatsApp on a medium for Gujarati session no Ajay Sambri. So actually, sorry, uh, amuk loko ne confusion thegi to itle. Amne aaj no address aapi shi. Actually, Gujarati ne event kalle shi. Ane any matte registration uh, complete thegi shi. Kemi amar ek aja ne upper registration thegiya tha. But any recording shi YouTube par mukase. Ane bija bhi awa ghana bada event future ma aise. To tamhe se kya hoon pari ano badare pracharan karte des. But atyare awadu akhu English ma shi. To tamhe. Stay karam at a welcome job for our work in English. Matha said, Sorry about that. Not exposure. I think that's all. <laughs> Thanks, Akta. All right. So, oh, yeah, we did have some cases like that. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that, people. Hopefully, uh, yeah, we'll communicate better next time. This time, I, somebody else actually did that. So, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Okay. So, Back to some science. So what we are observing tonight is on, is actually we're use, our team is using both the Subaru telescope and uh, the Keck telescope. Although right now the team that's here is all on the Subaru telescope. We might share some of the observing session from Keck where our partners or colleagues are a little bit later. So we are currently observing something called a cluster of galaxies. Galaxies uh, like the Milky Way and many others don't live um, separately, but close to get, many of them live in big groups or what we call clusters. And we're looking at one that was detected in a very distant universe. It was detected using a different method that finds matter along the line of sight from us to very far away objects. And so the, this other team found a bunch of basically gas that would indicate that there is a, a lot of material to form stars and galaxies in a, one place, but when they looked for the galaxies, they did not see them. So what we are doing is hunting for those galaxies to see if they're there or if this is some kind of large matter distribution where, uh, for some mysterious reasons, the galaxies have not formed like they do in many other places. And we can talk about that in a little bit more detail. When speed at top range. We are using the Subaru telescope, which is one of the big telescopes atop Mauna Kea. It has an eight meter mirror. And right now, uh, we were briefly showing the sky cameras from uh, the top of the sun. And it looked pretty grim earlier this evening for fog and ice and high winds and maybe even high clouds. But right now, it's reasonably clear. So we are actually taking data. So. Thank you, uh, Ekta, for putting up some of these uh, sky monitors. So on the screen right now, you can see 
And the top left image is a fisheye camera that's looking straight up. And if you look in that camera, there's two white bumps in the top left. Those are the domes of the Keck telescopes, which we are using one of also tonight. The Subaru telescope, which is right in the bottom. And you can also see the, I think you can see Jupiter up there. Um, and the moon, perhaps, um, in some of the clouds as uh, they pass by. And so you can see that uh, other views of the mountain, of the summit from other cameras. Um, so you can see there's some light clouds, some cirrus, but we're able to observe through that. On the bottom right, that colorful map is a, um, shows us where there's cloud cover. And you can see we're in light clouds. Hawaii Island, the big island, is the sort of um, triangular shaped uh, island in the oh, yeah. light orange -ish yellow area. And you can see we have some bad weather a couple hundred miles away, which hopefully we will avoid for the rest of the evening. We're actually only observing for the first half of the night, and a different team has the telescope the second half of the night. Occasionally, you can hear the telescope telling us things like that an exposure has completed um, or that we're moving to a new target. Now, there's a nice picture of the um, Subaru telescope. This is not it right now because it's uh, clearly not the daytime uh, right now. And these are other pictures of the interior uh -huh. telescope. This round structure here that you see is uh, the mirror. And this is what the control room up at the summit looks like. So we usually have in a control room between six and eight monitors just to control the telescope and the cameras. So it's a lot more than just staring with our laptop. We're now lucky that from home, we can remotely connect and view many of these screens by tiling them up onto a big uh, TV or a, some, a big screen uh, just from our laptops. At some telescopes like Keck, you can actually remotely control the instruments completely. Oh, yeah. Here we speak with the observer from Subaru Observatory, who's actually taking the data for, for us, but we're uh, talking to them checking out how things are going, looking at the images, making sure we're in the right place, and Morning. things like that. I wouldn't see that top ring. Morning, high humidity. So right now um, we have, oh, we were looking at a screen for a moment that had an earlier image, and that's right there, um, from when we were setting up earlier in the evening. So actually, right, this uh, this screen um, is the current uh, mm -hmm. observation. So this is actually where we can monitor the observations as they come out. And so that uh, left screen where the mouse is, um, that's actually a, a differenced image of the last two images that we've taken. So because we're looking in the near infrared, um, so um, redder of, op uh, of optical or redder than red, um, it, the sky background is very high, so we actually, to see the objects that we're um, trying to observe, uh, we need to subtract two images, and then you see, um, uh, so you see a light part of the image here, uh, so that's a that's a star or, or a galaxy, and then this is the negative um, um, uh, subtraction of that galaxy or star on the previous image. And so we check to make sure that the images have uh, are, first of all, in the right part of the sky. <laughs> That's important. Uh, and then um, we're now monitoring the image quality. So like how um, turbulent the atmosphere is, so how much it twinkles and, 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 and uh, scintillates the light coming in from, uh, from these galaxies or stars. Um, and we're also checking the background of the sky. So if it gets to be too bright, um, and this could be because of uh, the moon, or this could be because of clouds, uh, then we have to change the exposure time that we, that we make um, uh, for these observations. So we will constantly keep an eye on this as the night goes along um, to see what the, what the quality of the data are coming out. And now we've switched back to another screen, which is uh, you can see the countdown timer. 
That's counting the amount of time in the exposure. You can see below the blue text, the blue text there that says MCSA and some numbers. Those are the image numbers that are going to be written out to the disk. Morning. These Hi. cameras are all digital, so we're all writing computer files. And you can see it says X, EXP time equals 30. That means we're taking 30 second uh, exposures. It, the countdown timer takes a little bit longer than that because uh, it takes some time to open the shutter and read out the chip and things like that. And um, as Brian was saying, when we're looking in the infrared, the sky background is very high. So when we take a single image, basically we see a very bright sky and our faint distant objects are tiny invisible blips on that. And so what we do is we take one image and then another image and we subtract them from each other the two images we take slightly offset in position and when you subtract them the sky goes to zero because the sky stays roughly the same and then you'll see the positive bright star from one image as brian is showing there and then the negative from the image that you subtracted so everything there's a got like it the object and it's offset negative when we actually process our data we deal with it differently but just for a quick look analysis to be able to see that we're in the right place, this is what we do on the fly. And you can see the sort of green and black uh, window in the bottom left corner there that has a bunch of dots with a curve going through it. That's actually trying to measure the shape uh, of the stars that we're looking at and how wide that curve is tells us how much the atmosphere has blurred out our image, which is a measure of something we call the seeing. And the worse the seeing, the more blurred out the objects are. And Mauna Kea usually has very good seeing, but tonight I think we had about one arc second seeing at the beginning of the night. If you don't know what an arc second is, the moon on the sky covers an angle of about half a degree. Um, each degree we split into 60 arc minutes, so the moon is about 30 arc minutes across in angle on the sky. In each of those arc minutes, we cut into 60 arc seconds. So um, an arc second is about one 1,800th one of the uh, size of the moon. So it's tiny. And that's how much the atmosphere is blurring things out. Usually on Mauna Kea, we can do about twice as good on a really good night, or even three times as good. So someone's asked the question, can you judge the distances to the objects? In this case, not just by, we cannot tell by looking at them, um, we know they're far away because we know that many of the things that we're looking at are galaxies and they look tiny, but a galaxy halfway uh, to um, a galaxy 7 billion light years away or 10 billion light years away looks, both of them look like a tiny blip to us. So we measure distances to galaxies either by taking a spectrum, which we're not doing tonight, at least not on this telescope, that's exactly what we're doing on Keck. Um, and looking for features in the spectrum that tell us how fast the galaxy is moving away from us, which also tells us how far it is from the expansion of the universe. Or in some cases from the colors of galaxies, we can, if we have enough information, we can estimate the distances by trying to figure out, okay, this is what a typical galaxy's color is at one distance and it gets shifted like the Doppler shift of sound. Um, as it gets further away from us, and we have a way to estimate the distance, but not measure it exactly. It's not like uh, in nearby stars, we can um, use a method called parallax for some of the stars in our own galaxy, but uh, Hi, we, we have to use redshift as a measurement of distance uh, for these objects. And I also see we are joined by here by a uh, Raja Bhattakurta, Aloha Raja. Raja is the, I should say, the PI of, if that's the right term, for Shadow of the Scientists. He's at UCC Cruise. Two, um, two chips? Is that right? Yeah, 21, 21. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Hi, Raja. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he's joining us. He tries to join most Shadow of the Scientist sessions to, to see what's going on um, and say Aloha. I guess I don't know, Roger. You want to say anything about uh, Shadow of the Scientists? No, I'm, I'm just delighted to see see this is happening. I'm excited about tonight, tomorrow night. Tomorrow there are two sessions, I guess. One dedicated session, one open session. I see that Ekta has um, undergone um, mitosis. Has become two people. I see two connections from Ekta today. Yeah, Ekta, we're. Dueling Zoom, so she can uh, she, 
she's actually running the observing and also sharing the screens. That was supposed to be my job, but I'm having some connection issues. So I'm narrating, but not sharing the uh, insert observing screen. No, this is really nice to see. Um, there's all kinds of things that we are envisioning. I mean, um, Shadow the Scientist is continuing to evolve. I had a long meeting with Jamika and Hillary Davis um, yesterday. I guess it's already uh, Thursday here. And some of the ideas we are uh, thinking about are um, some kind of um, incentive system in Shadow. Uh, I'll describe, I'll explain what I mean. Um, now, at the end of every quarter, let's say we're in the uh, we're in the UC's winter quarter. We end the, the quarter ends on Friday, the end of the third month. Um, we would tally up how many hours people have uh, taken part in shadow and issue certificates to everyone who crosses some threshold. You know, an electronic certificate. We thought we would include a you know a relevant scientific plot from one of the uh, science, uh, you know, one of the science teams that has hosted Shadow. So we would have a special plot for every every quarter and would be a certificate. That's one idea. Another idea is to enter people into a lottery. And it, we were going to do all of these things, actually. So issue certificates, enter people into a lottery where um, you know, we just draw randomly. And then if you win the lottery, you, um, you know, have a small group meeting, uh, let's say five people on Zoom with you know with one of the scientists like Brian or Roy or myself or Ekta, you get to spend um, you get to spend half an hour and you um, you know speed at top range spend, spend some time um, you know you send in questions in advance and if your question gets picked that's what that's what you talk about during the session so uh, the idea is to send in questions that can't be looked up uh, on Google for example something that's um, so that, that's something we're thinking about. And we're also thinking about a photo contest, something like, um, like science in progress, a photo contest. Again, we would open that up through a lottery system. So anyway, we're thinking about these incentive system to make, um, no, have something that, that's a follow up to shadow the scientist participation, incentivizing it. This is news to Brian and Roy because we were just discussing it uh, with Hillary yesterday, so. Oh, thank right. you. Lots going on. We had a great question on in the chat. Um, does the Subaru telescope also do spectroscopy? So Brian's putting some question answers to that specific question there, but I think this really gets to a more basic issue about telescopes. So usually when you think of a telescope that you take out in your backyard, you have the telescope with its mirror and an eyepiece and you look through it. For us, we have the telescopes like Subaru, which is basically a giant eyeball or a giant uh, mirror. Um, I think Brian's trying to is show us something. Um, yeah, so this is the this is the super telescope as it is now. So this is this humongous. I see, I see your right. side actually. Brian, turn around other camera. You're pointing at the wrong computer. I'm looking at your side of your head. Uh, on my second connection. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have two connections open. You can see it. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is uh, this is the uh, camera within the dome uh, here on the right, and so this is actually Subaru as it is now. Uh, down here is the instrument cage. I guess the cast cage. Oh, uh, so that's the that's where the instruments are. Um, and then this is outside Mauna Kea. So there's the snow, and there's the uh, that's probably the base facility. Or sorry, that's the that's the enclosure for the astronomers that are up on the on the summit. <clears throat> we see there's one car up there. <laughs> it's probably Kataros. Yeah, and so when we talk about a telescope, that's really the light collecting area. In a way, it's like our eyeball, right? In our eyeball, we have our retina and our lens and things like that. Um, so yeah, there's a picture of the Subaru telescope and inside it is an eight meter mirror. And we have this big mirror that acts like a giant eyeball to collect the oh, yeah. light. And then what we do with that light is we use different kinds of cameras or the term we use is instruments like a medical instrument or like a musical instrument, but it's an instrument that perform different functions. So some will take pictures, some will take spectra, some can do both. 
Some can take spectra at very high resolution, very high wavelength detail, splitting up the rainbow of colors and very finely. So we can see great detail in the spectrum, um, but then you need a relatively white object to look at. Some can do spectra of multiple objects at once. This camera, that this instrument that we're using, for instance, can take pictures in the infrared, but also a mode where we could take spectra of one object or a couple of dozen objects at one time. And so they're all specialized, just like when you go to a doctor's office, there's an x-ray machine, there's a CT scanner, there's an MRI scanner, there's nuclear medicine studies, there's pathology biopsies. And in that same way, we have all these different tools that are just attached to the telescope and all the telescope itself is doing is collecting a bunch of light for us to then analyze with these different suite of tools. And exactly the same way a doctor would maybe diagnose something using both um, taking your temperature and your blood pressure and a CT scan and then getting lab for yeah. us to understand how a galaxy works or a star works. We have to use different tools to analyze it in different ways and see different things going on. Whether we're talking about the hidden dark matter in the galaxy that we measure by how fast the galaxy yeah, rotates or that top properties range. of the stars or of the cold gas that we can't observe unless we look at longer wavelengths in the submillimeter that this telescope cannot do. So um, all these tools are, are there and we have to kind of use one at a time. It's very different than what most people think of an astronomer looking through an eyepiece and, and staring at the sky. Not exposure. So let's see if I can share my screen real quick. Ekta, uh, just, um, Ekta, you can hear me? Yeah, through one of these ways. <laughs> Okay, um, 0.82 arc second seeing on the last uh, exposure. Okay, uh, so we have plan, original plan was to uh, focus on this for till 10 o'clock. Uh, do you wanna be on this for like 20 minutes more, Brent? Uh So we should just put the time right down the middle. I, I forget what the change over time is. It might be like 12, I forget, 12.37, something. Yeah, 12.25. Um, so yeah, whatever whatever the halfway mark is from when we actually started, um, that's that's when we should go. Not exposure. So you just heard Brian and Ecto were discussing how to split up our observations. We're basically looking at taking very deep observations, and by deep we mean we're looking at the same patch of the sky for a long, long time to see very faint objects. And all we have for this half night is two adjacent patches of sky, basically right next to each other. Um, so it's not a very exciting night of observing in the sense that we're not moving around a lot, we're oh, not uh, uh, looking at lots of different things, we're trying to see very faint galaxies very far away, so we're using the biggest telescopes in the world and taking very long exposures, or in this case taking lots and lots of short exposures and we'll add them together later. Yeah, you, you want to go ahead? Yeah, just take the timestamp of the first mission, just go, um, I am... So I just put up a screen showing the uh, different yeah, instruments that are available on Subaru. So you see they have eight instruments, actually six instruments here that are uh, belong to Subaru Telescope, and then a whole bunch of instruments that come and go um, that other people have built. And these are not small. These instruments are not like the camera that, like a DSLR camera. I don't know if there's a good... Um, yeah. There's no web page. Nice page. Here showing it, but some of these instruments are the size of a room or a small car. Um, so they're they're large, complicated things. So Tim, Tim is asking lots of great questions. So the tracking is done with guiding. So there is a guide camera that is um, looking basically at a star on a small detector and just basically trying to keep that star centered on the same pixel. So you can do that um, with a, there are some home telescopes that work the same way that have guide cameras. You can buy digital cameras for a telescope and, and do that. So it is it has a built-in sort of tracking to counteract the Earth's rotation. Um, but it, to do that finally, we use a, a guide camera. So I don't know if we have a window that shows the guide camera and I don't know if it, uh, or someone can. Is there a guide or window on one of the GERS screens? Oh, 
Exposure. Yeah, other people should feel free to so I, ask questions. Yep. The first six was it 2023 uh, HST, Ecta? So, uh, yeah, eight, I already printed it. Yeah, 23, yeah. So, so we've been an hour 40 roughly on this, um, and we have two, what, 240 till changeover, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, roughly another 20 minutes. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So we're going to do our only move of the night, hopefully, <laughs> in about 20 minutes. So stick around, then we're going to move the telescope. We are actually moving the telescope now. So we're we're observing in one patch of the sky, but we're moving the telescope around slightly around that patch um, because a, a detector um, can have defects associated with it. So like if you had a, a you know, um, uh, even uh, like an I iPhone camera or something like that, and you had a piece of lint on the front, <laughs> and so it was blocking off some of the picture, uh, you, it, you could actually still take good pictures if you took a, a bunch of pictures moved around like this, and then you combine them in some uh, kind of fancy way. So if you did a median combination of, of all of them, uh, what you would get back is the actual picture itself. So that's more or less what we're doing here. Um, so we're going to a specific location and just moving the telescope around very, very slightly so that we don't have any problems with the um, with the issues on the ground here. So anything, we want the actual sky, we want the actual uh, galaxies. And so we want to take out the effect of uh, as many things as we can. And so uh, this is taking out the effect of any problems with the detectors that we're using. I'm answering a question on the chat about uh, how tracking is done uh, during a 30 second exposure. I'm, I'm, I'm about to answer it. I tried to answer it out loud, but maybe I was muted. Um, but OK, I, I'm going to give a little background on galaxies and galaxy clusters if uh, you guys want. What do you think? Roy, can I um, chime in with one quick thing before you do sure. that, which is the telescope is moving constantly. I know you said you're going to you're hopping around within a patch of sky and that you're going to jump to another. But the telescope is moving constantly to counter the rotation of the Earth. And that's actually related to the question that Tim has asked. Um, and so um, basically, there's a bright star. Mm -hmm. The guide camera points at this bright star and you calculate to within a fraction of a pixel where that bright star's coordinates are in guider pixel coordinates. If, that, if the telescope's overall tracking is not perfect, that bright star's pixel coordinates will change even by a fraction of a pixel. And you can detect that. And if you do detect that, you adjust the rate of tracking so that the star stays, so the star centroid stays constant to within a fraction of a pixel. And that's exactly the answer I've written in the in the chat. So the telescope is constantly moving, a uh, coarse motion and a fine motion. Um, actually, I don't know if it's two, it's probably more than two, but uh, at least those two, a coarse motion and a fine motion. Uh, the coarse motion is sort of um, standard from a lookup table. It, uh, it, it knows how, how fast to move the different motors. It only moves in the east-west direction. That's how the sky rotates, not in north-south. Um, but the fine motion is done at the guider camera level where it keeps the star's position fixed in fractional pixel coordinates. Sorry, and I didn't mean to um, belabor that too much, but onto the science, Roy. Okay, so I have a Thank little- Thank you for that clarification, Roger. That was great. Uh, I'll go through some slides about galaxies and clusters. Um, my colleagues have, are gonna be sick of these, although this is an older version, so I'm mixing it up. Um, so uh, for those who aren't that familiar, very basic background is that we're looking at faraway galaxies and Milky Way that we are inside of is in itself a galaxy. And what a galaxy is, is a giant collection of stars, gas, dust, and this mysterious dark matter, which is actually most of the mass of many galaxies. It's all held together by gravity. And here's an artist's depiction of the Milky Way galaxy, kind of what it would look like if we could fly out of the Milky Way and look back down upon it. That would be such a huge distance that it would take literally uh, 100,000 
hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years for us to our rockets to get out that far. So this is just an artist's rendition. So, um, and, but galaxies, you may often see pictures of galaxies that are these beautiful spiral galaxies, but they're like our own Milky Way. Um, but most galaxies in the universe turn out to be these boring red blobs that are called elliptical galaxies. They are red because they are, consists mostly of old stars and old stars are lower mass and cooler and they glow red. Young stars, which are very hot and have short lifetimes, where short is something like 10 to 100 million years, are also very hot and glow blue. And when those start, when, so when stars are being born, and making stars, it looks blue because it has these young, very hot, very luminous, very bright stars, stars that can be a million times as bright as the sun. One star, one single one of these hot blue stars is as bright as a million of our suns. It's pretty incredible. So the Milky Way, the light is dominated by these relatively small number of very luminous stars, but there are a lot of faint red stars there. We just don't see them. But in any case, galaxies come in these two basic flavors, as well as irregulars, which are galaxies that don't look like scheme. But you also see that this, not just the shape of these are different, but elliptical galaxies don't tend to have young stars in them, whereas spirals are still making stars. So as I said, uh, star, spiral galaxies, we often call them young and blue and gaseous. They contain a lot of material to make new stars. Whereas elliptical galaxies, we call old, red, and dead. That's sometimes a little bit of an exaggeration. Um, I should have been wearing red because I'm older. Um, uh, sorry, Roger, you're wearing red. Um, so um, most elliptical galaxies made their stars billions of years ago and no long, are no longer making new stars and don't have any gas in them from which to make new stars. So they're just going to slowly evolve and the higher mass stars in them will die off. And then the lower mass stars and even lower mass stars till there's basically nothing left except white white dwarfs, which are the basically leftover embers of dead stars that no longer have fusion. And then there's the irregular galaxies that can be due to collisions, that could be because they haven't had time to form into their proper shapes yet and build up their shapes. And if we um, ask what galaxies are made out of, um, most galaxies are made of this mysterious dark matter that we have not essentially no idea what it is, but we can infer that it's there from its gravity. And this is relevant to the project we're doing today at Subaru because we're looking at a place in the universe where there should be a lot of galaxies, but we don't see them. We see evidence for gas from which galaxies should form, but we don't see, we haven't yet seen the galaxies. We're hunting them for them today. So the, this is a good reminder of the fact that while we may consider ourselves normal, well, I don't consider myself normal, but uh, uh, the we think of the material that we are made out of as what is the normal stuff in the universe, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen. In fact, that's only a tiny percentage, a few percent of the material in the universe. And there's five to 10 times more dark matter in the universe than the stuff we're made out of. And then that still only adds up to about a quarter of the stuff in the universe and three quarters of the stuff in the universe is another thing called dark energy, which we won't even talk about here, um, but which makes up the rest of the mass energy budget of the universe. So just everyone here should be humbled by the fact that our brains, our computers, everything else, the galaxies that we're looking at, the light we're getting from the stars is all being made by the matter that is actually only a few percent of the stuff in the universe. And that's really all that we understand. And um, we, the, the rest we're trying to under, figure out. But for today's project, the, um, we're looking at clusters of galaxies. And to understand what a cluster is, we can look back about 100 years at when famous astronomers like Carlos Shapley, Edwin Hubble, Fritz Zwicky were mapping the skies and realized that galaxies like the Milky Way are not just scattered all around the sky, but um, they are distributed in clusters, which are big clumps of hundreds of thousands of galaxies that are connected by filaments of galaxies. And then there's these big relatively empty patches called voids. And here's an example. The bottom right is a slice of the universe where we're 
we are here in the middle of this diagram. That does not mean we are in the middle of the universe, just in the middle of this diagram. And as we look out, each little when, black dot when Eda, um, is a galaxy. And you can see the galaxies form these walls of galaxies and filaments and where they come together, there are big giant piles of galaxies. And whenever I look at this map, it reminds me of looking at a map of the population distribution in the United States, where we have highways connecting sub suburbs, which are next to big cities. And so you can see the similarity that there's this structure. And so the universe has this kind of similar structure to the population distribution on the planet. Now, so I always talk about clusters of galaxies as being the big cities. There are groups of galaxies, which are like little suburbs, and then there are rural areas, which we call the field, or even more empty areas, which we call voids. Now, we all know, or many people know, that not just in the United States, but in many countries, the way that people behave, the way that they dress, the way that they vote, is correlated to where they live. So, if we look at a map of the United States and look at how do people vote, I'm not saying which way is the right way to vote, I'm just saying there's a correlation, that in the densest parts of the United States, people tend to vote one way, and in the less dense areas, people vote another way. So you see that there's a correlation. Now, does this mean that people who I'm vote older. blue in this map and live in denser areas, they vote blue because they live in the higher density areas? Or do they move to higher density areas because they want to vote blue or they have those leanings? Or is, what are the processes in our environment that make us one way or another, depending where we live? Well, it turns out if we look at galaxies, if we go to a city of galaxies, like the right hand in this image, a cluster of galaxies, notice it's mostly elliptical galaxies. There's very few spiral galaxies in a cluster, especially in the modern, in the, the universe today. But if we go to smaller groups, they'll have a mix of galaxies. And if we go far from clusters to the fields, to the total rural areas, very relatively few elliptical galaxies. So why is that? Do they like to form in one place or the other? Are there physical things that happen to the galaxies in one place or the other to change them? And if so, what are those? And to put this into our local context, we live in a giant supercluster called Lanya Kea. You may have heard of that. That is a Hawaiian term, which means immense heaven. And this diagram shows in red. The red dot is where the Milky Way galaxy is. Every tiny white dot is a galaxy. And those white streaks are the way that galaxies will move over the next trillions of years due to gravity. And what you can see is that all these galaxies in this region of space are going to move together until they all end up in trillions of years in one giant pile. So this is our local supercluster uh, in the universe, and we live kind of on its outskirts. And what we're doing with today's observing campaign is looking at a structure probably kind of like this in the very distant past. So I mentioned that galaxies look different depending where you live. So if you look in the field, which is the rural areas, what you will see is that there are more bright blue galaxies and where if you go into the clusters, there are more bright red galaxies and very few faint blue galaxies. Now that's true today, but if you look back in time, you also see that galaxies change with time. So elliptical galaxies are smaller and eventually you don't really see many of them. Spiral galaxies also lose their structure. They might be redder when you look back in time. So a lot of the vote, it's similar to like looking at how voting patterns in a country change over time or other patterns, population patterns. We're gonna be looking at how galaxy patterns change back in time. And the place we're looking at now is uh, almost 10 billion years in the past when galaxies are just sort of growing up or teenagers. So if we look in a galaxy cluster today, like I said, we see mostly elliptical galaxies in the past, we don't. So we know that something makes galaxies to be elliptical in clusters. And one of the research projects we're doing is asking why, and actually the project on Keck is more focused towards that. What we're looking at tonight is something that should look like a cluster of galaxies like this, because we can, I, another team has identified as having a big pile of matter where galaxies should form, but we have not yet seen all the galaxies that are there. So 
with tonight's observations, we hope to be able to see all the galaxies that are there. And if we don't see galaxies, then we have found a very interesting concentration of matter that for some reason galaxies have not yet formed in, which would be very interesting oh, for yeah. our understanding of how cosmo how galaxies form. All right. So this is a this is all stuff from another talk. Um, so no, I'll, I'll skip these. So in the on Keck, we are using spectroscopy to look at how at distant galaxies and measure their properties. So that's how we can measure. The, someone asked about measuring distances uh, in detail. I'm going to skip all this stuff. This is from another talk. All right. So um, I'll leave it there. That's the quick back on the galaxies and and clusters. But actually tonight we're looking at a field where there should be galaxies, there should be a cluster, but people haven't seen it yet. A oh, good question about Starlink satellites. So they can be a problem, especially for sky surveys, where there are telescopes that map big parts of the sky every night, and they can uh, have Starlink satellites passing through um, their images in like large numbers sometimes, depending what part of the sky they're in. So usually the Starlink satellite satellites are more visible at the beginning and end of the night, sort of lower close to the horizon, and we're not observing there. But even there are Hubble Space Telescope images that have Starlink satellites passing mm -hmm. in, through them. So, yes, and Starlink is not the only such system, and there's projections of having tens of thousands of such satellites. So it is actually a big problem, yeah. and the International Astronomical Union. Right. Just one second. Uh, yeah. Brad, uh, do you want to let this other theater complete, or do you want to kind of uh yeah no that's fine yeah we can just let that run through i mean yeah, a, a, mm, yeah. an extra couple minutes not gonna matter i think i think this is uh yeah we should just yeah. let it go all the way through uh but yeah so then we can then we can make our move um and i know actually keck's moving at the same time roughly so uh maybe we can check in with our keck observers after we make our move and they make our, their move and then uh once things are settled then we can come back to that so we want to move to L four V after this after this dither. Already? Uh yeah. L four V humidity. Uh, sorry, please tell me again. L four. L four V. Ah okay okay. Now current is L four S okay okay. Yeah. I understand. yeah. They want okay, to move okay. to L4B okay. after this. L4B, okay, L4B. Okay, yeah. uh, uh, sorry, stop, stop, stop control. Ah, sorry. sorry. After oh, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm controlled. So, um, I think after this sequence, uh, let's again. And go front end with uh, L4B. Okay. That sounds Thank great, you. yep. What's the timing on the focus? About a couple minutes? Uh, not a couple of minutes. I can count. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, roughly three minutes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All right. So we had a question about seeing gravitational lensing in our observations. So for um, people who don't know, Oh, yeah. Gravitational lensing is a uh, is where the massive gravity of an individual galaxy or of a galaxy cluster bends the path of light that's passing by it and distorts the images of objects that are behind the cluster or galaxy as seen from our uh, our point of view. And so, in a massive uh, galaxy cluster, you can see um very distorted weird looking images and i'll put one up here in just a second as soon as it loads up on my computer um Start exposure. 
So here is an image of a galaxy cluster. All of these elliptical galaxies are in one cluster. And you see these very strangely shaped objects. And those are objects don't actually have that shape. They are behind the cluster and um, their shape is being distorted by the gravity uh, of that cluster. It's very similar if you have a wine glass or something like that and you look through the bottom uh, a flat part of the wine glass uh, at objects, it will distort images the same way. Um, it's not lensing because we don't have a lens like a piece of glass, but the gravity is actually distorting the fabric of the universe, the shape of the fabric of the universe, and therefore the images that we see. In order to have strong lensing like this, you have to have a very massive uh, galaxy cluster. And you also have to have galaxies behind the object that you can see um, lensed. Right now, we're looking at a very far away cluster so we have objects even further behind that that we can see that much harder. But we, that does happen sometimes where people see very distant galaxies that are strong in that cluster. And actually, the lensing can also act as a, just like a magnifying glass can magnify the object. So sometimes we've been lucky, not necessarily our team, but others to see very far away galaxies that we couldn't otherwise see because they're they've been magnified by this gravitational lens. But our research hasn't focused on these most massive clusters. But if we did detailed analysis of the galaxy shapes, we might probably identify some amount of lensing going on. People have done that with some of our lower redshift galaxies that we've studied in the past 20 years or so and, and done uh, measurement. Hey, Roy, I'm, I don't know whether this is... Uh avoidable but i'm getting a lot of background noise from is that just uh, from one of the okay that is either brian or lap like this laptop uh gotcha gotcha it's the communication yeah, this, this is from the summit uh so we, yeah we're just um doing some um uh things for the upcoming focus run so that's that's where, that's where that gotcha. uh, oh, exposure. but um yeah this is part of the observing process so uh, our board astronomers are, are fixing the telescopes for <laughs> Then I wanted to say a quick thing about the science here. Effectively, the gravitational lensing of a telescope, it's a lens, is like a cosmic telescope. And so in this particular instance, the James Webb telescope took this, right? Oh, no, this is not Webb. This is something. This, this is a Hubble. Hubble. Yeah. This is Hubble. I can see that from the four pointed stars, not the six pointed. Um, Right, because um, the struts of the secondary mirror of Hubble are four point, uh, produce a four pointed diffraction pattern, whereas the segments of James Webb produce a six pointed star pattern. But in this case, Hubble is lined up behind a cosmic telescope. So it's really, you can think of it as two telescopes in action at the same time no, in series, not in parallel, in series. One, Hubble and the cosmic telescope together looking at galaxies behind them. Channel one day. So Wesley asked about these few unexpected, extremely large galaxies identified soon after the Big Bang. So um, that's a recent story out of uh, from some James Webb Space Telescope observations, and I I will um, add a word of caution to any of my answers here is that if you look at the paper, the science paper that describes these objects, they're described as candidate massive galaxies, which means we have observations that suggest they might be massive galaxies in the very early universe, but we don't know for sure. So it is the case that we have been both with James Webb and even yeah. ground-based yeah. telescopes somewhat mature looking galaxies in the first sort of billion uh, years or now, half, million, half billion years of the universe and those are sometimes seem like they would be challenging to form in our current models of galaxy formation i think the observations that oh made a uh, brian if you're talking to me you're muted um so if if these galaxies then are candidate early massive galaxies turn out to be true, then right now in our computer simulations of how galaxies form, we can't make them. Um, but that just means that we have to 
improve the physics or understanding of, of what's happening. So, um, or it could be that these candidates turn out to be galaxies that are closer to us that we've misidentified. We don't have exact measurements of their distances. We've The scientists have estimated their distances based on their brightness in different filters. And they, they could have made a, they, it could be some other weird kind of galaxy closer to us that's masquerading in its colors like one of these more distant galaxies. So um, I'm reserving judgment on, on those. But uh, one of the things are um, one of the things uh, uh, that our team is looking at is how do galaxies evolve over cosmic time? So we're trying to understand what changes galaxies, when do they make their stars? Are there conditions in the universe where they're more likely or less likely to make more stars? And so it may be that we will we'll understand the process of making stars and the material in galaxies um, better and be able to explain these observations of these early galaxies. The other thing that we really don't know about those uh, about the early universe is that the very first generation of stars that's formed have only hydrogen and helium. They don't have it's like carbon, nit nitrogen, oxygen that the sun has, for instance. And that those heavy elements are actually used in the way that the sun fuses hydrogen to make energy. Those early stars have a different fusion process. We know they must exist, but those stars, physics, internal physics is different than stars today. And all we have is computer models of them. And it could be that the way those stars form, the way they blow up, the way they return energy into the universe or into the material around them, impacts the ability of those er, ability of those early galaxies to form so there's a lot of work on this what we call population three stars the, the very first generation of stars and trying to understand if our physics of those is correct and how that would impact the ability of these early galaxies to form well wesley just said wesley you just said in the chat it seems like the more we know, the more we don't. Scientists call that job security. So, for instance, dark energy is something we've only known about roughly for the past two decades. Dark matter for about five decades. So as we've done more and more measurements of the universe, we've uncovered that there's all kinds of things going on that we don't understand. And so, indeed, the more questions we ask and try to answer, Often those answers raise even more questions. At some point, hopefully we'll turn that around and start to have more understanding. But indeed, uh, it's sort of like being in a cave with a flashlight. And the more you shine the flashlight around, the more cave you realize there is to explore. And so eventually you hope you get to the point where you found the edges of the cave and been able to map the whole thing out. But right now, Humanity is still in its early stages of exploration, not just of the universe, but of the undersea world, of uh, biology, uh, of evolution, of ma uh, many different things. So for all of you young people who are here, there is plenty of work for many future generations of scientists. It may be that in your science class, you feel like you read a bunch of material in a textbook, and that's what we know, and that's what you learn. Well, that's what science has found out over the past few hundred years, but there's a lot more that we don't know. And those textbooks change. The material that is in the textbooks from 20 years ago is not what's in a textbook today because we've learned more. And we have a lot more to learn. And that's one of the things that with Shadow of the Scientists and with other programs like Roger has the science internship program at UC Santa Cruz, um, we're trying to bring more people into a new generation of scientists to help answer these many questions in having many different points of view from different parts of the world, from different backgrounds um, and different you know, forms of creativity. It's really needed to look at things with, with fresh eyes and come up with new ideas. So Robert asked a question about galaxy evolution. So spiral galaxy arms have young blue stars in them. 
because there's gas there and they can make stars, eventually those blue stars fade away and leave the red stars, um, older red stars behind, but they don't just migrate to the center of the galaxy. They'll be there. You'll end up with a red disky galaxy, but eventually something does make spiral galaxies change their shapes. Sometimes they collide. Um, sometimes they're gravitational, they have other gravitational interactions. Sometimes they interact with the gas of a cluster that change the shape of the galaxy. But we actually don't understand how all elliptical galaxies are made. So there are not enough, for instance, if you take a, two spiral galaxies and you collide them together, as the Milky Way and M31, the Andromeda galaxy, will do in about 3 billion years, um, they make something like an elliptical galaxy eventually. The gas, the stars just change their orbits. The gas smushes together, makes shock waves in the gas that turns on star formation and uses up the gas. And then you end up with a, something that looks kind of like an elliptical. But there aren't enough collisions between spiral galaxies to turn all spirals into ellipticals. So that what exactly changes galaxy shapes is not all that well understood. It's pretty complicated. And it's different in different places in the universe. In clusters of galaxies, for instance, galaxies are moving so fast that they just pass by each other. They tend not to actually additionally interact. The gravitational collision isn't usually like a, a head-on sort of thing. I don't know if you can see my screen, but they'll orbit each other a couple of times and then eventually collide. Um, but if they're passing too fast, they don't actually capture each other gravitationally and they just kind of change their trajectories. So in small groups of galaxies, their galaxies are moving slow enough relative to each other that they will eventually collide. That's why the Milky Way and Andromeda are in a small group called the local group. And yes, they'll merge. But if we were sitting inside a big cluster, we'd fly past each other. But on the other hand, in a cluster, you have lots of these flying past interactions or you, and you interact with the material that's floating around within the cluster. There's a lot of gas and that changes the galaxies. So all of this kind of physics is very challenging to understand. And, and our team uses a lot of observational data to try to tell people what to, physics to put into computer models. Okay, all right. Back to observing. These guys, and then we have these guys. Yep, that's perfect. Yep, yep, I agree. So it looked like they were just checking their positioning on a new field there. Yeah, so we, we just made our move. We had to we had to mute um just so we could concentrate on what was going on. So we just did a um a focus with the telescope. So we, we initially did a focus at the beginning of the night and we refocused the telescope just in case uh uh, temperatures have changed. Uh, there's a variety of different reasons why you might want to focus the, the telescope. Um, it seemed like we made a little bit of a focus change, so it was good that we did. And then we moved to a new part of the sky, which was just about um, uh, about four arc minutes away from the position that we just were. So um, for those that weren't on earlier, um size of the full moon is roughly uh, 30 arc minutes and so we moved about one tenth of the size of the the full moon um so we're we're looking at a different part of this massive structure we think that there's two uh, components associated with it and so we were targeting the first component uh, for the first part of the night and now we're going to target the second component And Arya asked about, are there lone galaxies? And yes, there are these, if we look at these maps of the galaxies, there are these huge voids that have very few galaxies in them. Um, and so those galaxies, you know, basically live, they're like hermits. They, they live by themselves. They don't interact with much around them. But even those over time will eventually flow uh, to whatever is the closest large gravitational pile, pile of matter. Um, but yeah, yeah, even today we see uh, these galaxies. And if you look at the um, evolution of the universe, the universe starts out relatively uniform with tiny density fluctuations. And under gravity, those big changes in density change into becoming the clusters and filaments that we observe today. So the universe is becoming um, 
more empty in the sense that the voids are getting bigger and the galaxies that are in filaments and clusters are slowly flowing into each other and making more and more massive clumps and leaving the rest of space emptier. So eventually the, the, everything will be in these big, far distant, far separated super clusters with big empty space in between them. But there are lots of solo galaxies around still now, and there were certainly even more in, in the past. And that's one of the things we try to do is we look at, there are people who will just point to tell, look in sort of random patches of the sky, well chosen, but random patches and study them in great detail and try to understand what happens in just a typical place. <laughs> if we look at that map I showed of the United States before, Right. If you were to just pick a tiny area at random on the map, you'd most likely end up in an empty. Sorry, part yeah. Of the map. You want me to check the scene? Yes. Yeah. Hi, um, And so people study those kind of areas, or like in our projects, we focus on the cities and and look at the feeder suburbs into them. Oh, oh, yeah. That was uh, that was a good focus. <laughs> so three point five pixels uh, at point one two. So. Uh, yeah, so about 0.4. Woohoo. So Brian was just measuring the seeing that image quality, which is now down to below half of an arc second, 0.4 arc seconds, which actually at the wavelengths we're looking at is close to the best that Mauna Kea as a site can deliver. And I don't know what this instrument can deliver because it has its own optical distortion. So in this K band filter, about the best you ever get on Mauna Kea is a quarter of an arc second, and we're now at 0.4. So yeah, that's actually amazing. Out. That's excellent. Unfortunately, it seems like we might have clouds coming in. So Mauna Kea gives and it, it and it takes. <laughs> so we have some uh, fairly, well, they don't look so thick, but um, some decent clouds moving in from the west. So we're now pointed away from the clouds um, and hopefully they'll pass to the north of the the area that we're looking at, um, but we have to keep an eye on them. Do we have a fan? Do we have a giant fan? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Gemini and I was commissioning that, but you know, we had to go. We had to go down, so couldn't quite get it up yet. Who is the cat observing that going? As far as I can tell, pretty good. Um, so I can actually share a screen. So I'm I'm actually simultaneously keeping an eye on the Keck observations and the super observations. So I'm a little bit schizophrenic tonight. <laughs> Forgive me if I'm I'm all over the place, but let me share one of our screens. Warning, high wind speed at top range. So um, this is actually, so I, right now I'm um, I'm in the Subaru uh, base facility, um, which as Roy mentioned is right next to the Gemini base facility here in Hilo uh, on the big island. Um, so Gemini is where I work. That's a different telescope than Subaru. And then Keck is yet another telescope on Mauna Kea. In fact, it's two telescopes, uh, two twin telescopes, or almost twins. Um, and uh, so I am using the screens for, for Subaru. So we have eight screens that we use to uh, look at the data, monitor, sky conditions, uh, conditions on the ground, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then I am also connected to uh, four Keck screens that are. Uh, our colleagues are interacting. So the mouse moving around now, that's actually our other postdoc. No, actually it's our, it's our graduate student in our group um, moving um, moving around, trying to look for, I guess we're actually doing an alignment right now. So um, this is a, a different type of observation. This is a near infrared uh, spectroscopic observation. So in both cases, um, we're observing the near infrared, the moon's out, it's very bright. And so this is the time of the month that you want to look in the near infrared because um, it's not so affected by the moon. Um, and so 
Um, this particular screen, what they're doing is um, th they're using an instrument called MOSFIRE. Uh, so MOSFIRE is a multi-slit uh, spectrograph. So um, basically there's an array of configurable slit units, basically some bars that, that can move uh, independently. And uh, we have precursor observations. So like, for example, the observations that we're taking on Subaru tonight, uh, I mentioned in the chat earlier, uh, we're going to use those uh, hopefully later um, to pick out galaxies that we're really interested in by their colors. Um, and then we would uh, either use Subaru or Gemini or Keck um, to specifically place slits on interesting galaxies. So we would select, uh, so as Roy mentioned, we're looking at this overdensity of matter that was uh, discovered by this uh, uh, group called Lattice. Um, but there seems to be not so many galaxies, or at least not so many galaxies that have been seen in previous observations. So these super observations are an attempt to uh, identify these galaxies in images. So we use differences of colors. We're looking in uh, what's called a medium band filter now, and we're looking for emission of hydrogen and doubly ionized oxygen um, from these galaxies that are about, um, about 10 billion light years away. And so if we identify interesting objects, then we would go to a, a multi-object spectrograph like MOSFIRE, um, and we uh, we can place about 30, um, uh, so we can place slits on about 30 uh, galaxies of interest. So in a, a typical image uh, on the sky with Subaru, we can see thousands of objects, uh, and then we pick you know 30 of our favorite um, that we think are particularly interesting, and then we get um, dispersed information on. So we get very fine information on the colors of these galaxies, and we can see this, uh, for example, hydrogen emission or uh, doubly ionized oxygen emission or singly ionized oxygen emission um, in the spectra, a near infrared spectra from an instrument like MOSFIRE. So um, the stretch is a little bit weird here, so you only see kind of black, um, but all these numbers uh, correspond to these uh, these bars that are in place. So it goes sequentially from uh, one to about 90. So there's about 45 um, slits that you can do in total. Normally we get uh, roughly about 30 objects on. Um, and so on each, this is called a slit mask. Uh, on each mask, there are uh, five stars, alignment stars. And this is what you're seeing in the, um, the image to the right. So these peaky profiles are actually, this is, this is very good. This is telling us that um, they're aligned right at the location of the stars. So this is a, a, a one-dimensional profile of this uh, box that we have. So the box for the five alignment stars, uh, we're taking a cut across and looking at the, uh, the profile in the X direction, in the Y direction, and then um, centroiding. So basically determining uh, to sub, pixel location uh, accurate uh, precision um where these stars are and then we're making moves uh based on uh, where we expect the position of those of those uh, stars to be and so i think they've just gotten aligned um so this looks really really good and um so i'll go to a second screen here so um so this is really cool actually so in a um in an optical spectrograph, or at least the ones that exist right now, um, uh, uh, so when you have these boxes for alignment stars, um, this is actually a sheet of metal um, that you that you laser cut, um, and you uh, are, this is immutable, so you can't change um, these boxes. Um, so they're they're within the optical path of the telescope. The light goes through them and uh, you see the stars. And so when you actually want to start taking spectroscopy, um, you get the spectra of these stars as well. Um, but on an instrument like MOSFIRE with these configurable slit units, so you can see actually things are moving. So these are different optical elements. This is the grating. Um, this is the, the filter wheel. Um, so this grading is, is what's going to disperse the light. You can see the light uh, coming in, white light coming in, and then disperse into rainbow in this in this graphical user interface. Um, and we have a certain filter that we look through, so a certain color. Um, but it's actually uh, taking these alignment boxes, so these uh, places yeah. where the stars were, and it's moving them to a different location uh, so that we can target um, uh, other galaxies of interest. So we don't actually have to take spectra 
of these stars throughout the whole observation, but we can take a, a spectra of galaxies across the entire detector. So um, this Warning. configurable slit unit stuff is is very very powerful um, and allows us to take it, it allows us to increase our efficiency of observation by uh, somewhere around ten percent. So they they just got aligned, uh, so you can see all these slits here on this uh, graphical user interface. Um, I actually don't want to move it too much because <laughs> I'm actually in interactive mode, so I'm I'm uh, also able to control the telescope there. Um, but uh, these uh, slits are uh, precise at precise locations of galaxies of interest. Uh, the light will be piped through these slits, and then it will go through a disperser, and then end up on the detector. And so we'll get a, a spectrum of something like 30 galaxies um, uh, at, at, at the, well, we hope at the location of, of a different overdensity uh, uh, of galaxies uh, in the same, uh, mostly in the same area of the sky uh, that we're, we're looking at with Subaru. And looks like, they actually started exposing. So be after a couple of exposures, just yeah. to make sure that they're in the right location for sure. Uh, we can bring our other observers on and they can say hi for a second. And since we were talking about arc seconds earlier, just to put that into uh, uh, a little bit more context, when our eyes, when we look at like letters on a screen, the resolution of our eyes is about one arc minute. So if two pixels on a screen are separated oh, by less than an arc minute, they look like a single dot to our eyes. And we're talking about having an image quality that is, in this case, half an arc second. So there's 60 arc seconds in one arc minute. So we're talking about seeing something, a level of detail of the telescope that is about a hundredth the size of the smallest dot that you can see on a with your eyes. Uh, so that's pretty remarkable to think that we're oh, seeing that level of detail. And Tim is exactly correct. He's asking as sextants moves lower to the horizon, do you have yeah, worse image quality? Absolutely. Um, so. We actually don't like to look very close to the horizon. That's something called the air mass, which is how much atmosphere you're looking through. If you, the it's a numerical quantity that is the secant of the angle um, uh, from the horizon. So if you're looking straight above, you're looking at an air mass of one, and that gets higher. Yeah. So uh, once we get to an air that. mass of about two or so, we don't want to observe anymore. Although if you're chasing some very rare object that's setting oh, like oh, that, you might, might do so. But you get both more blurring because you're looking through more atmosphere and you also get more of um, dispersion due to the atmosphere. That's why the sunsets are orange on the horizon, but the sky is still blue overhead. So you get more refraction um, and you also get more material absorbing the, the light along the path. So in general, it's not a good thing to, to look through a lot of atmosphere. Well, can I say a quick story about arc seconds? Very quick. Um, an arc, uh, as you said, an arc second is one sixtieth of an arc minute, and an arc minute is one sixtieth of a degree. It's very similar to the units of time, where uh, a minute is one sixtieth of an hour, and a second is one sixtieth of a minute when you're keeping time. The reason it's called a minute is because it's a minute part of the main unit. And the reason it's called a second because it's the second time you do the division. In uh, apparently Newton's Principia, there's references to the third uh, the third minutum, which is one what we would call one sixtieth of a second. And what we call a second mm -hmm. was called the second minutum. A little bit of Latin trivia. Warning, high wind speed at top range. Actually, we got a 0.55 on the last exposure. exposure. It looks like clouds are mostly avoiding us right now. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. The fan's working. Uh, Roy, you mentioned the science internship program. I want to give, do a quick shout out that uh, we have um, our application for yeah. high yeah, schools. It's a program for high school yeah. students. And I, I see several friends on this call who have sent high school students to this uh, program like Ted Chang. Ted is connected from Shanghai, but there are students from all around the world applying. And last I checked, so over 3,000 students who have applied to this year's science internship program, and there's two, two days to go. We close on Friday. So if you're, if you're a high school student, please apply. Aria, I know you've applied. I hope you've completed your application. Uh, but um, yeah, oh, we'll be submitted tomorrow. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, so I just wanted to say that this uh, program has grown hugely to think that it's in its 15th year, and in its first year, there were three students in the program. This year, we have 3,000 applicants. So I just give me a um, Now, I also want to add that not related to the science internship program, but you heard people joking about having a fan to blow away the clouds. Um, one of the uh, issues with ground-based observatories is that we are subject to the weather. If it's cloudy, we're stuck. So this has actually been a pretty bad winter on Mauna Kea. We're actually very happy to be observed. Our previous observing run earlier in the month was completely wiped out by snow, fog, ice, and 100 mile an hour winds um, up on the summit. Um, and that was part of something like almost four weeks when none of the telescopes opened due to bad weather, which was a record. Uh, so going to space has its advantages, but ground-based telescopes, for instance, uh, can be much larger than space-based telescopes. We can update the technologies on ground-based telescopes. So James Webb, which uh, launched you know just yeah. a year ago, um, is using camera and detector technology that is close to two decades old. Um, because it had to be all prepared to go into space and test it and things like that. And as we develop, and can never be fixed, we can never uh, repair it, we can never upgrade it, we can never replace it. So um, it's kind of a house that you built once and you don't get to upgrade any of the appliances or the windows or fix a leak. Whereas ground-based telescopes, you're not launching into space, you can build them bigger, you can continuously um, yeah. the, the, as new detector technologies and, and new ideas for instruments come out, um, we can just build new ones and attach them. So old telescopes live a, can live a long time. As a good example is the Palomar Observatory in yeah. California, yeah. which yeah. opened in the early 1940s, and it's now been amazingly 80 years, and it is still operating and doing science. And there's no space telescope that's gonna last us 80 years. And that telescope built in 1940s has a mirror that's twice the diameter of Hubble's. And it's almost similar in diameter to James Webb. So um, going to space has its great advantages of being able to atmosphere and being able, being able to observe colors of light that we can't observe because they're absorbed by our atmosphere. That includes X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet, many colors of infrared light, especially in the further infrared. Um, but if the light can make it through Earth's atmosphere, then there's many advantages oh, to bring it on the ground. So they're Brad, all complementary to each other. Is the plot showing sky background still up there? I can see it. I can, uh, I can bring it up. One, one, yeah, so it's holding it's holding pretty steady. There was a blip uh, for the focus uh, where the exposure time was quite a bit less. Um, but yeah, you can see the new observations following more or less the same trend as the previous ones. Yeah, okay. Just want to go check. Thank you. Yep. Oh,
starting folder. Uh, Ekta, Brian, uh, and Roy, I'm going to take your leave. It's, uh, it's This is going spectacularly, and I'm so excited about tomorrow night and the two sessions tomorrow night, so I'll, I'll connect, try to connect to both. Um, Great. I'm traveling Thank you, early tomorrow morning, uh, so I, I'm going to call it a night. I have to go to, uh, so I'm, I'm actually going to be going to Griffith tomorrow, and I'll connect uh, uh, right after that. I'll, I'll, when I go back to my hotel, I'll connect to the you said it's at uh, it'll be 10 p.m. our time in California, right? 7 10, p.m. Our yeah, the first session is 10 p.m. Uh, PDT, yeah. And that's a dedicated session, and I'm one of the yeah. thousand people who are already yeah. registered. So uh, at some point, I'd love to see who the thousand people are, whether it's your contacts or my contacts or Karthik's or some combination. It'd be interesting to see that because uh, oh, yeah. that's, a, that's a huge number. Um, and then when uh, I'm also really excited that our team, you know, our uh, Jamaica and the Shadow of the Scientist team, we are going to the National American Indian Science and Engineering Fair, which is a, a high school fair for indigenous students uh, in Oklahoma. Um, we're going there over the weekend. I hope to students for uh, participate in Shadow and SIP. All right. I will say good night. Take care. Okay. Good night, Raja. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Warning. Hi, Hello. Oh, hey, Ben. I was just about to send you a message. <laughs> well, this is the second time I've joined, and the first time my computer kicked me out right away. So, fingers crossed. <laughs> All right. Hi. Welcome. So, this is this is Ben Forrest. He's uh, another researcher at uh, UC Davis. He's actually at UC Davis in the remote observing room, remotely observing. Uh, with the Keck One Telescope, along with Preeti Stab, a uh, graduate oh, student at UC Davis. And they were kind enough to join us now that they're all calm and settled uh, on uh, on their target. So uh, Ben, Preeti, I actually talked a little bit. We were um, sharing one of your VNC screens. We were watching you align. Um, so I gave a little bit of a rundown of what the configurable slit unit thing was and um, and what people were seeing on the screen, but uh, it would be awesome if you could talk about how things are going and what you're looking at and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so apologies in advance if I repeat uh, what, what Brian may have told you already. Um, but yeah, broadly, broadly speaking, our program is, um, I guess aligned or adjacent to what uh, what's what's being done at Super tonight, but we are looking at uh, several of these uh, potential clusters of galaxies or proto clusters, as we call them, in the early universe. Uh, so these kind of amalgamations of galaxies at you know a few billion years into the universe's lifespan, uh, and so in order to try and confirm that these are in fact these uh, systems of galaxies nearby to each other. Uh, we're taking spectra uh, of these of these targets, which uh, I guess you may have seen some of the screens there. But essentially, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, there's light coming from these objects. We're going to spread it all out, and we're going to look for particular features uh, that give us information about the about the individual galaxies. And from that, we can determine exactly how far away they are 
and thereby how close to each other they may or may not be. Uh, so yes, so far, um, observing going going pretty well, uh, especially relative to our last few nights when we've had uh, layers of ice on the telescope dome and have been unable to open and observe anything. Uh, so yeah, it's been it's been quite good, quite smooth so far. The instrument has been working great. Um, and we've been, we have gotten several hours of, of pretty good data, uh, at a few different pointings on the sky, trying to probe these different areas of, uh, of this one, this one potential system. Uh, so yeah, I guess Ryan may have talked you through some of the more technical bits. Um, uh, yes, the, uh, during during the alignment process, something that we've noticed this evening, just one of the many technical things that can occur during the night that you have to deal with. Um, we noticed that the system that we initially used to determine where the telescope is pointing uh, was not as accurate as we would as we need it to be for our, our observation. Uh, and so there's there's two systems that do this process: a, a coarse alignment and then a fine alignment of the of the instrument and the telescope uh, and so the course alignment was not working and so what instead we did is we pointed uh, the telescope and object that we knew the coordinates of very precisely uh, just to make sure that we were pointing where we thought we were and then we moved to our target and just went straight into the fine alignment and so what that means is that um, Pretty much if you are confident in our accuracy of pointing the telescope to a very high level, then we could skip this one step that seemed to be having problems uh, and just go straight into the fine alignment, which I think Brian Brian showed some of. And that, that worked very well, actually. So um, it's, it is quite amazing the precision with which we can, we can point these, these massive pieces of technology at the sky. Um, but yeah, pretty much, not pretty much, a lot, a lot of times when we're observing, there is something on the technical side that is different or unusual that we kind of have to think on our feet about and deal with. And uh, there, are, there are people at the telescopes who are, are far better and far more informed on ways to do that than we are. Um, so we just kind of nod and try their suggestions. Uh, yeah, all, uh, all has gone well uh, so far tonight, so. Uh, yeah, I will. I'm happy to ask or answer some questions if people have them. Or uh, Brian, I don't know if you have a particular thing you'd like to discuss. This is one second. Uh, so we want to stay on this field only for the night. So feel free to repeat the sequence after this. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll just take this up to the to the changeover time. Yeah, Akta. Because uh, there's no real reason to take a standard star. The only uh, the only other thing we would do would be taking a standard, and I don't think we should do that. Warning: Hi, when speed at top. Also, keep in mind that we didn't take uh, dome flights and calibrations uh, today, so we we'll have to do that tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Warning: Hi, when speed at top range. Don't forget to take the flight tomorrow evening. <laughs> Thank you. So Kadar, you would do it in the in the evening tomorrow rather than in the morning. All right, yeah, because uh, morning uh, we uh, second half night we set up telescope for different uh NASA NASA IR focus. So yeah, uh, uh, it uh, had uh, large overhead to do. And so the assumption there is that nothing uh nothing falls on the detector in in a 12 hours or something like that, right? <laughs> Just trying to make sure that there's no like weird hidden assumptions there. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> I believe it. Okay, all right. So let's keep everything clean until t tomorrow evening at least. Yeah, yeah, I understand you are, you are, you are anxious, yeah. Okay, 
Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> well, very strictly speaking, uh, we, we cannot uh, predict no big earthquake tomorrow data. <laughs> right, right. There's, there's been quite a few of these days, so yeah, I understand your reticence to try to predict that. Uh, even without big earthquake here, if we if we have uh, if we have a kind of uh, for example tsunami warning, very serious tsunami warning, we may cross pressure or because uh, our staff and uh, some of the staff have uh, have to evacuate their family. Yeah. Right. I remember I remember at least one at least a bit more. Yeah, we can send them some to, to tsunami warning. <laughs> yeah, I think I don't think I will be if uh, if there's a tsunami evacuation notice too. So <laughs> I think I think I'll be running uphill as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Ben, um, so did you like explain kind of what was going on in the screen? And I guess like you guys have taken different um, slip masks tonight, right? So you've, you've set up on a, a variety of different observations. What, can you talk a little bit about like um, why you would target the different regions, uh, what, what you're doing when you're changing a slip mask, that, that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, right. So yeah. So each of these each of these slit masks, right, has a separate configuration, uh, and that is to, you know, essentially align them with the configurations of different galaxies on the sky. Uh, and so, over these these structures, with which span, relatively speaking, large areas on the sky, we can't just do one pointing of the telescope with this instrument and get all the information we want. We need to do several pointings over different areas to probe uh, different galaxies. Uh, now, additionally, not only are we interested in just confirming that this structure is, in fact, a, a group of galaxies in close proximity, uh, we also want to probe differences across the structure. So are there areas that are very dense with large numbers of galaxies close together compared to other areas that are maybe a little, little bit less dense? Uh, and so these these oh, different masks are probing different regions that we've identified, which uh, have, we think, different densities. Uh, and so then after looking at the structure itself, we can also look at these individual galaxies and we can say, OK, if there's a galaxy in you know one of these very dense areas where there's lots of nearby galaxies, is that galaxy being affected uh, by being in that environment? Is it? evolving any differently than a galaxy that is not nearby any other galaxies. Uh, and we can do that not just by comparing galaxies in these very dense environments to galaxies that are out on their own, but also by looking at uh, areas of intermediate densities. Uh, and that's how we can try and quantify and qualify uh, the effects of these dense environments on galaxy evolution. Uh, so we do know that these effects on galaxy evolution in dense environments exist in the local universe. We see it in nearby clusters of galaxies, uh, where the galaxies in clusters are much uh, more evolved than uh, similar galaxies outside of these cluster environments. Uh, but that the strength of that signal, that difference, uh, appears to be weaker as you go earlier and earlier in the universe. And so we're kind of trying to find out if we can see any evidence of those effects taking those environmental effects taking place um, early in the universe. Again, when the universe is a few billion years old is the epoch that we're currently targeting. Ben, would you mind if I shared a figure from your upcoming paper? Please go for it. So I'll let I'll let you talk about this, but I, I just wanted to have people visualize a little bit better kind of what we're looking at and 
uh, what the what the scale of this this type of thing is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, you can see, I guess, speaking of scale, so the scale bar in the upper right, um, that is in length one tenth of a degree. Uh, and so the typical thing to say is if you hold out your, your yeah. pinky finger at arm's length, happening. look up at the sky, that the width of your finger is about a one full degree. Uh, and so this line in the top right here is one tenth of that on the sky. Um, and so the different colored areas are different regions that we've identified as um, having an excess of galaxies or being these, these over dense regions on the sky. And so we have we have six different colors here uh, for the different systems. Uh, and so, you know, across this region of sky, uh, which, you know, again, maybe, maybe about the width of your finger at arm's length, that sounds sounds like a pretty small area uh, of sky, but in fact, on, on these scales, it's, it's quite large uh, relative to the size of the field that the telescope captures, for instance. Um, and actually, actually the, uh, the instrument that we are using, uh, kind of the field of view of it is about uh, the length of that, that line there. It is about a, a tenth of a degree or uh, um, And so we're kind of putting down these kind of rectangles of the width of that line on these different parts of the sky to try and uh, either confirm that these colored areas do have more galaxies in them at a certain distance uh, than other surrounding areas uh, or or say that oh no in fact they do not and uh, you know some of the assumptions we made about these over potential over densities are incorrect uh, but so far, uh, our success rate has been pretty good, um, and so the that red area in particular, um, we have we have I think eighty confirmed galaxies all at a very similar distance uh, that are within that red outline, uh, and so that is at, at these distances that is that is a very large number um, and very. Uh, I don't know if unprecedented is the right word, but it's it's very large and very convincing that there is in fact an overdensity of galaxies there. Uh, the other regions we have not had as much time to follow up yet, and so that's part of what we're doing this evening. That's to follow up some of those other areas and try and see if those two have these Ooh. large numbers of oh, galaxies at a similar distance. Um, but yes, it's it takes a, a large investment of time. Uh, pretty much each mask we're spending like an hour to an hour and a half on. Uh, and so if we can get through, we'll probably get through four tonight. Um, and again, that's that's covering only a fraction of this of this plot here. Uh, so it's a long term endeavor. Uh, it's the takeaway there. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So these uh, these structures again, these are kind of the progenitors or ancestors, if you will, of the galaxy clusters that we see in the local universe today. These are some of the most massive, most massive structures and groups of galaxies uh, that we that we know of. And these are, or things like it, are uh, the things they evolve from. So Ben, I have a question. Okay. So you've picked like 30 or 35 galaxies to target with the with Mossfire. And in like a typical, I was telling people earlier in a typical image that we get with uh with Subaru on Morks, you know, we get thousands of objects. And um, you know, we've taken some precursor or other people have taken some precursor imaging uh for the field that we're looking at. Um, but they, you know, for, for our Subaru observations, we're using a specialized medium band filter to try to pick up uh, emission from uh, hydrogen and doubly ionized oxygen. Um, and so I was saying to people that, you know, you know, we could potentially pick out objects to target with MOS fire or an instrument like it in the, in the future using colors uh, from our Subaru images and other people's images. 
Yeah, is that what you're doing or are you doing something else? Uh, so that is not exactly what we are doing, but the uh, kind of the overarching theme is the same. Uh, so those those same hydro, the hydrogen and doubly uh, uh, ionized oxygen lines that, that Brian mentioned, those are actually the same lines that we're looking for uh, for galaxies in this structure. Um, however, we're looking for them slightly differently. Uh, where the, the Subaru observations tonight are, are taking images um, and then seeing if there is, they're taking images of a very specific wavelength of light and seeing if there's an excess uh, compared to another set of images that target a broader wavelength, um, broader range of color. Uh, this is actually looking in much finer detail in terms of wavelength space or color space, right? So uh, we can we can actually pick apart each of those three lines, the two doubly, doubly ionized oxygen lines and the hydrogen line. Uh, whereas in the Subaru data, all those lines would, you can kind of think of it as being blended together. Uh, and so that allows us a little bit more precision with determining exactly how far yeah. away uh, these different these different systems are. Uh, but both, so that's an advantage of, of this instrument, MOSFIRE, that we're using. Uh, the disadvantage, or the advantage of MORCS, as, as Brian mentioned, is that in that, you in MORCS, you are able to pick up everything in the field, right? Every, every galaxy that is emitting light in that wavelength range above a certain amount will be detected. Uh, whereas with MOSFIRE, it's, it's only the galaxies that we decide to follow up that we can potentially get. Uh, get information for. So it's a it's a trade-off between the uh, the number of galaxies we can target and the uh, not the quality, but I guess the uh, the resolution of the data that we get on this that, that we're looking at. Complete. So both have their advantages and they're they're actually quite complementary to each other. Uh, but then further, as Brian said, they both actually rely on this uh, initial imaging of these fields that has been done by by others uh, over over many years and with many different telescopes uh, that allows us to say okay with with confidence this is an interesting target that we should follow up. Did that answer your question, Brian? That did. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate yeah. it. You're welcome. Hey, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's me. Yeah, you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I scared you. Um, and so why why can you only target thirty galaxies, Ben? So you, uh, I no I noticed you have like a a big old array there, but you make these little tiny slits um, to target specific objects. Why can't you put like a bunch on, you know, I don't know, like uh, why can't you do like a hundred or 150 yeah, or a thousand yeah. slits? What's, yeah, what's so limiting that, here? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's uh that would be awesome. It it would be awesome. It would be great. Um build build me that instrument. I would be very happy. Um yeah, so there are there are of course technical limitations uh, coming to mind. Uh, with, with observations um, and so among them are the size and weight that instruments can be to uh, fit on and be used by a telescope so obviously if you have a telescope that's moving around and there's an instrument attached to it if the instrument's too heavy or too large that's going to cause severe problems yeah, okay, okay. So this particular instrument, uh, the decision was made to have uh, 46 of these sets of bars that you can yeah. move but around to form a slit, which you place on an individual galaxy. And so you can have a maximum with MOSFIRE of 46 uh, slits to, 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 to galaxies. Uh, if you wanted to do more than that, you would need so if you're using the same technique, the, yeah, you would need a bigger, heavier uh, instrument. Uh, okay. Uh, um, okay. As far as why you need an individual okay. slit and you can't have two so adjacent slits on the same line, I guess would be the way to say it. Um, that comes down to how the light is then projected uh, onto the computer chip 
which yeah. then reads it out and tells oh, okay. you what data you have. Um, and so when we have a slit that's placed on a galaxy, the light from that galaxy is dispersed along the horizontal direction. Uh, yeah, so in this in this figure on the bottom left uh, that Brian's showing, right, each one of those um, horizontal strips is one of these sets of bars that come together. Yep. yep. Um, and so you can have one galaxy on there and it's like gets dispersed out in the horizontal direction uh, onto, onto the detector. Uh, so if you were to have two galaxies that were you know, next to each other or on different slits, their light would be dispersed onto each other. Uh, and you would have to kind of disentangle that data uh, in order to try and find any meaningful conclusions. Um, and that is that is a challenge that uh, people undertake. Certainly, we uh, we actually have some data, which might be where Brian is trying to get me to go with this. <laughs> um, we uh, we currently have a program with the Hubble you got me, Telescope, um, which is doing this, um, where it's kind of a you can think of it as a combination between the advantages of something like Morks, where you get every object in the field. And something like MOSFIRE, the instrument we're using, where you get this very detailed spectrum. Uh, and so the particular instrument on Hubble that we're using kind of combines those features where you get every object on the field. If it's bright enough, you get to detect it uh, and you get a spectrum for it. So the kind of data resolution, a little bit less, but still pretty good data resolution that you get with MOSFIRE. Uh, however, you do run into this problem where there's so many objects and so much light that's being dispersed onto the chip, onto the detector, that objects do interfere with each other. Uh, and so that is something that you know, we have various techniques and tools that we use to try and discern, okay, how much light is from one object and how much light is from another object. Uh, and so we can, we can do that and in, in theory, get the best of both worlds with, uh, with high data resolution and large numbers of galaxies. Um, so that's that's a very exciting project that uh, the ECTA is also working pretty pretty hard on. Um, and we are, uh, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to seeing how that, how that pans out. Uh, so yes, there are many, there are many different ways to get interesting and valuable information on the same set of data. Um, and you know, what, what type of data you need is uh, determined by the science you're looking to do. Uh, you know, is it better for your science to have a very large number of galaxies so you can do some sort of high precision statistics uh, with low statistical errors? Or is it better to have very detailed information about a very small number of objects? Uh, or maybe it's somewhere in between. And so the uh, science you want to do that then motivates your choice of instrument that you want to observe observe galaxies with, or I guess whatever whatever extra galactic or extra uh, extra Earth <laughs> objects you're, you're looking at, uh, whatever that word is. Yeah. Um, so yes, there's uh, there's there's a lot of very cool and innovative instruments that people have have designed and built. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's very cool to see how those advance, uh, throughout, throughout the years and generations of telescopes. So, Ekta, um, do you, uh, do you mind sharing screen seven? So, uh, Ichi, who's, uh, one of our support astronomers tonight, just did a quick, uh, reduction of our observations from the first portion of the night. Exposure. And yeah, so this is th these are our observations. So in any individual frame, uh, we're taking about 30 second observations now. You, you barely see anything, but this is now a stacked. Uh, hey Brian, that stack yeah. is on the on the um, observer zoom and not on the um, STS zoom. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> There's way too many things going on here. Thanks, Roy. Oh, yeah, that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So this is now a stack of something like what how long were we on it? It was like an hour and 40 minutes, something like that. Mm -hmm. 
So an hour and 40 minutes, roughly, of 30-second exposures all combined together. And I think, so there's two channels on Morks. Uh, we're looking, I think, the uh, channel one on the left and channel two on the right. These are both the same wavelength, um, but different parts of the sky. So it's just uh, the light is piped to these two different parts of the detector. Um, and and um, yeah, so we can see a lot of um, a lot of objects in, in this deeper exposure. Um, we can see things like uh, edge-on spiral galaxy here, uh, perhaps an elliptical galaxy here. Um, little, so we're looking for these little tiny dots like this. So this this is our science right here. So these kind of things that are you know barely visible in this image. Uh, what we'll do is compare this image to an image taken in a uh, a broader uh, set of wavelengths. So um, something like uh, 100 nanometers in, in width. We'll, so we'll collect all the light from that 100 nanometers. Uh, the, and those observations have been taken previously by other teams. And here, um, we're probably looking over something like 20 nanometers, specifically at the, the spectral location of where this hydrogen emission and doubly ionized uh, oxygen emission from uh, galaxies that would be a part of this particular large scale structure uh, where we'd expect them spectrally to emit. So if we see, as, as Ben was mentioning earlier, if we, if we see a bump, uh, so uh, we see uh, a gal uh, an object in this image to be really bright with respect to um, the image that has the larger wavelength coverage. Um, that probably means that there's uh, an emission uh, of some sort, a strong emission of some sort, um, and that could be from this um, hydrogen and W ionized oxygen emission, or it could be from something else. And so we would use uh, this, this information in combination with a bunch of other uh, observations to try to determine the distances to these uh, objects. And once we uh, make that determination, uh, then we will, um, depending on how precise we can we can uh, make that determination, and there's a variety of ways of doing analysis so you can determine how precise you might be, um, uh, then we would probably follow up these objects with MOS fire or something like it. But even just from the image, you can get a, a really good idea of how uh, distant these galaxies are. Uh, our main science goal, as Roy mentioned, is to determine whether these big, this big uh, suspected uh, matter over density uh, contains as many galaxies as we think ought to be in, in this type of system. Um, so if, if it does, then that's super interesting because we haven't detected them before uh, for some reason. Uh, and so this will tell us something about the nature of those galaxies. If there is none of these galaxies, then that's also super interesting because what kind of large uh, structure of, of matter doesn't contain galaxies. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense from uh, the kind of baseline astrophysical assumptions that we have. Um, so um, we, we should be able to determine at the very least uh, at the distances to these galaxies, the kind of rough estimate of how many galaxies are sitting in this matter over density. And we can even go beyond that. We can kind of determine um, some properties of these galaxies. So like how many what are the what's the mass and stars uh, contained within these galaxies, and how many uh, stars per year uh, these galaxies are forming? So we can get kind of rough estimates of the the distances, physical properties, and then we would use an instrument like MOSFIRE to get uh, uh, better information uh, later. Warning, high wind speed and top rain. Is this MSC red? Is that? But not yet, neither. But it's a bit easy. And simplified version. So we have no mask or no problem. <laughs> so okay. it's a dirty. Yeah, but still take uh, over me. So okay, yeah, no, no. that's not bad. Yeah, uh, Brian, Ekta, and the observing team and our guests. We've hit our eleven thirty STS supposed end time.
and we're only observing till when's our switch over? At twelve fifteen on Subaru, because there's a the instrument exchange takes a while. So I don't think anyone has any more questions, uh, or if you want to hang on, I'll be here for a little while longer. Um, but and where, when when did you guys change over? Uh, twenty six after midnight. Twenty six after. Yeah, I think I think Roy actually we can probably call it the session for tonight. So I know we have two sessions coming up tomorrow. Um, so maybe we can take a little bit of a break and uh, <laughs> to catch our breath before the what will be quite the marathon tomorrow. But uh, thank you everybody for for joining tonight. It was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to be actually open and to be able to show you observations. Um, we've done a lot of STS sessions where. We're just talking in theory about observing with telescope. And tonight we were observing with two telescopes. So it's really a pleasure to, to share that with all of you. And I want to thank uh, our entire observing team, um, including people on the summit, because we didn't actually introduce people on the summit, but there are people on the summit at, at 14,000 feet um, uh, moving the telescope around for us, both for Keck and for Subaru. And they are the ones that really make all of this uh, possible working under um, you know, sub-zero sea conditions and uh, with snow and ice and 50 mile an hour winds. So um, yeah, it's really a team effort. Astronomy is really a team effort. Um, and uh, it's just a pleasure to, to share that with everybody. Does anybody else have any closing words they'd like to yeah. share before, before tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I'll say uh, thank you again for joining us. If you joined us tonight, we're doing the same exact kind of observations tomorrow. So you're welcome to join us again, but you'll get to see some of the same slides and hear some of the same discussion, uh, uh, as well as some new things for depending on what people ask. But yeah, we're continuing our same observing program tomorrow night. If you have people you know that might be interested, then let them know the links and uh, uh, have them join us uh, tomorrow where hopefully the weather will continue to be passable. Great. Um, and yeah, just to add to that, I mean, we never know what, as Ben said, we never know what the universe is going to bring us. So every night, uh, yeah, we might have the same plans, same slides, same uh, everything, but, uh, you know, Hawaii is a dynamic place, so things on the ground can change and certainly things in space can change. So uh always always a surprise out there waiting for us okay thanks everybody good night and uh uh ben preeti i'll i'll check in with you guys uh maybe uh, a little bit later see how things are going but it looks like we're rolling right now yep and then uh brian i think you need to end this session i think you're the lead host. yeah so i'll i'll end, I'll end it yeah all right thank you all thanks everybody good morning good, good afternoon whatever time it is, whatever it is.